Good morning. Happy Sunday. This is going to be Sermon 141, True Love Chapel, here in uh, Washington State. Turning to 1 Timothy, and um, typically we go through the, uh, through the Bible every year following the reading plan, various reading plans you can find out about it on truelovechapel.com. And uh, I'll just preach generally some uh, simple messages on the New Testament portion of the plan. So let's do this. First Timothy 1 and uh, verses 12 to 16 or 12 to 17. Glory to God for his grace. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he has counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe in him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immoral, I mean, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, glory to God for his grace. Um, now, Timothy, this is 1 Timothy. There's also 2 Timothy and the book of Titus. Those are known as the pastoral epistles um, because they're basically epistles that are written to pastors or church leaders. Um, so... It's to, to the people who are already active in ministry. And Paul is, Paul is writing these letters. First Timothy, um, here it was written, it was one of the last books that he wrote. He, Paul was in uh, prison at the end of uh, Acts, around tr chapter 28, at the end of Acts. We read about Paul being in uh, house arrest in Rome. Uh, awaiting to see Caesar, Emperor Nero Caesar, whom he appealed to. And, um, but then it, the story kind of cuts off right there in Acts. But after that, Paul does get released from prison. And um, after seeing Nero, you know, he gives his testimony to Nero. Um, some of this comes from church tradition and all. But they say that he gave his testimony, and I mean, what a powerful testimony Paul must have had to, to go before Nero with his life on the line and just spill it all out. And, uh, and Nero, apparently, originally he was possibly a semi-normal person, but after having that testimony, you know, he did release Paul, but then after, after that, he just went totally crazy, and I guess that possibly could have been as a result of rejecting that testimony, rejecting such a powerful witness and testimony. You know, that might have been his last chance to accept Christ. And he, he, he refused it. And so what seems to have happened is that the devil entered into Emperor Nero and he became possessed. He became a beast. He just went totally crazy. Um, and started this massive persecution against the Christians. And um, I'm talking in the, in the first century AD here. This is around AD 60, uh, 65, 68, somewhere around there. Um, or, or possibly a bit sooner. And then, um, so after, after Paul was released by Nero, he was, he was freed. And then that, during that period, he wrote... First Timothy, Second Timothy, you know, before being arrested again, 
and the second time he was killed. And so it is towards the end of his life that he wrote these. And uh, so at that, at that point, you know, there's some, some differences between er, Paul's earlier writings and then the later uh, writings to Timothy. You know, people have noticed that the earlier writings, he seems to be more uh, emphasizing sort of this uh, spirit-filled church where the, uh, you know, all believers are just one in Christ and filled with the spirit. And then sort of towards the end here of his life here, He's writing more, uh, talking about church structure. So we have that in Timothy. We have the qualifications of deacons, qualifications of overseers, talking about um, just the structure of the church. So, you know, it's not necessarily that the church changed. It's still spirit-filled, but as the church grows, it becomes more important for there to be an organization to it, you know, a structure, I, w I would think. And, um, but anyway, so let me grab a bit of coffee. Hold up. <clears throat> so here we go with our passage. Um, Glory to God for his grace. Um, and that's sort of the primary message in Christianity too is it's that we're saved by grace uh, it's received through faith but our salvation is by grace it's the grace of God it's not something that we are able to earn it's not something we deserve it's something that is it's, it's grace grace is a unmerited favor so God is just out of his loving kindness um, offering us this eternal life, which we accept through putting our faith in Jesus Christ as the message of the gospel. Um, so verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Well, just right there, I mean, Christ Jesus our Lord, he's the one who, who puts us into ministry. And he's able to see someone um, as being faithful. You know, what kind of faith Paul must have had? A guy who ends up writing about two-thirds of the New Testament. Um, you know, basically all Christians <laughs> for, from, from the beginning to the end are studying um, Paul's writings. So he's extremely influential. But, you know, God saw him, even though it says in verse 13, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Well, it says, you know, Paul was such a bad guy, right? But, but Christ counted him faithful. He saw that he would be someone faithful. He's, Christ is able to see the good in you that no one else could see. Um, the, the church, even the church didn't believe it, right? When, um, remember when uh, the angel sent the guy to uh, to Paul, and uh, he's like, I know who this guy is, and uh, he's a persecutor of the church. And, um, you know, they're very skeptical about going there. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to see. It's hard to see the good in, in people, but the God, God can see it. You know, we tend to see someone for who they are, not who they would become. And um, it talks about, you know, he did his, his uh, bad deeds here ignorantly in unbelief. Well, I mean... Because you didn't know, it's not an excuse for it, but certainly the punishment would be lighter if, if you did did something wrong without knowing it versus willingly doing something wrong. Um, verse 14, And the, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Amen to that. And that is the message. It's, 
Christian message is not that we as Christians are great, it's that Jesus Christ himself is great. Uh, who we serve is perfect. We are not perfect, but who we serve is perfect. And his righteousness is imparted to us through this uh, this relationship that we enter into with him, which is a spirit-filled uh, relationship. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and that is the, the life of Christ manifest in you. And that is a... That is something that is, um, you know, the spirit testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. So it's, uh, it's something that you're going to know. You're going to you're gonna be aware of this relationship that you have with Christ. And it, I think it's different for everyone, but typically you're going you're gonna to know when God's speaking to you. And yeah, it's just, it's, you just know. I don't know. It's a spiritual voice. That speaks to your spirit and you know when God is telling you something you know when God is calling you and then uh, as you respond to that he, God does open himself up uh, more to you and show you more of himself um, so you enter into this this dynamic relationship which occurs now in this life so it's not it's not just all hypothetical something that happens okay we'll just uh believe this and maybe when we die we'll go to heaven you know it's not just like that it's um we believe this and we experience it now it's an active reality in our life now so there's absolutely no question about whether it's true or not because we experience it you don't really know something until you experience it for yourself and uh verse 15 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Um, you know, it's usually not the, the proud and self-righteous that end up getting saved. It's usually the people who are desperate and down and out. And they, they feel, um, you know, they, they need it. They feel that they need a savior because they're such a sinner. And, um, you, you get that conviction. You certainly can tell that Paul would experience conviction. He, he felt the, the guilt from his former life um, once he realized that Jesus Christ was, was real and that, you know, um, that he was, Paul was wrong, that uh, he felt that conviction and he wanted to change. Um, you know, you have to want to change. You have to want to repent. Repentance is, is a necessary part of your salvation. And um, so that's why I said it's usually not the self-righteous and proud that end up getting saved. The people who think that they, they're basically good people, so they're going to go to heaven. <laughs> that's, that's one of the biggest lies. Because um, obviously nobody is good, not, not even one. And uh, we only go to heaven through the, the relationship we enter into with Christ. And it is through the blood of the Lamb, through the sacrifice that Christ paid on the, on the cross for us. And uh, we receive that again through faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith is a, it's an active faith. It is a faith of a relationship with Him. Okay. Now, uh, I myself, I've, I've experienced something like this because um, I, I grew up being a Christian and uh, going to church and all that. And I, I believed in God since I was as early as I can remember. But there was a time when I sort of backslid, backslid and um, into, just lived an ungodly life. And then, uh, then there was a time when I got out of that and I moved to New York City and started going to a, a good church there that I liked a lot. And, um, and uh, I remember they used to have the, the altar calls and stuff. I was always responding to the altar calls and then I kept praying and all this. 
but um, I, I remember feeling that that guilt maybe maybe what I had done was too much maybe I wasn't gonna be saved you know and uh, when you have that guilt you're just uncomfortable in that place and you're just seeking God seeking God out of sincerity you know it's something that you really truly legitimately want and I uh, and you keep going for it, you don't give up, and, uh, and boy, what happened is God did respond, and I ended up experiencing something, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and it was a miraculous, um, miraculous occasion, um, it was a feeling of almost like just being electrocuted, and I could feel just this power going through my body, and, um, indescribable but the feeling of love and power of, and the feeling of God being there all the time and it's actually we're the ones who are blinded to his presence but the point of that story is that I wanted I wanted to seek after him it wasn't I wasn't just happy where I was at thinking I had it all figured out I actually got to a place where I felt desperate felt like um like I, I really needed Christ, <laughs> and uh, and then that's when I, the I think the more desperate you felt can feel, the more powerful the experience Christ may come through for you. But again, it's going to be different with everyone. But God will relate to you in the way that's perfect for you. And. Um, so. Verse 16 says, However, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Well, yeah, Paul is a, certainly a pattern. He's an example. Shows the long suffering of Christ, how he's able to put up with someone like Paul and turn him completely around and um, make him one of the greatest church leaders. Uh, when he was one of the, the worst persecutors of the church. So if it can happen to Paul, it can happen to anyone. It's It doesn't depend on how great Paul is. Was, you know, it wasn't just that Paul decided to turn his life around and um, do good. You know, he, he encountered Christ. He encountered him on the road to Damascus, and that's what changed everything for him. So until you encounter Christ personally, then you're not going to have any chance of changing. The, the change happens through the, the, uh, the encounter with Jesus Christ. And um, God often does take the people that you wouldn't expect. You know, the people who have little skills, little talents, little abilities... Um, people who have little resources, things like that, um, and uses them because that I think that's just a greater witness and testimony to the power of God. You know, people can look at that and say like, huh, because it's, it's not just that that guy was, you know, just gifted or, or um, a great speaker. It wasn't just that he had a lot of resources and a lot of friends that enabled him to succeed in, in uh, whatever it is, you know, build church planting or ministry or missions, whatever it is he's doing. If you start from nothing and, uh, and God uses you, it just shows that, you know, it wasn't you at all. It was God all along. So it's just greater testimony. Um, verse 17 now to the king eternal, immortal. Oh, so I keep saying that wrong. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So yeah, to the king, God is king, king of kings, Lord of lords, eternal. He's he's forever, um, infinite, past, present, and future. Immortal means. Uh, well, he never dies. Same as eternal, I guess. Invisible. 
invisible now, yeah. Um, one day we'll see him face to face, but this powerful God of ours is uh, purposely um, concealing himself somewhat invisible now so that to leave room for faith because without faith it's impossible to please God so if he was just like right up in your face then everyone would have no choice but to believe him and bow down and worship him because I mean every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that will happen when um, when he reveals himself but uh, as for now he wants you to have the the free will. He wants you to have the chance. You can either choose to serve him or not. And whatever you choose, you know, typically God's going to give you many choices, many choices. Make sure you're sure of that path you're going down. And eventually you're going to be confirmed in it. I mean, if you're sure you want to be a Christian, you're still going to be tested. You're still going to be tested if you're sincere, if you're going to persevere, uh, if you can make it through the trials then that's going to strengthen you if you're determined to be a Christian and to be saved. And if you're rejecting Christ, then obviously, uh, you know, you're going to be given chances. Are you sure you want to do that? But the people who persist in rejecting Christ, eventually they certainly they will get what they want, which is they will be separated from God for all eternity. They just... It's just so it's so foolish though. They don't realize how foolish they are because every good thing is from God. So it's like they their choice is to be separated from every good thing forever. And that's how incredibly foolish they are. But I don't know. When it comes to that some some things there's just nothing you can do. Some people they're just they're lost. And uh, we can try, we can pray for them, we can preach the gospel to them, but there's, they don't they don't respond to any of it. Like Nero, when they hear the witness testimony, it just hardens their heart even more. And so people like that, I don't know what we can do, just pray for them and move on. But we, there are people out there who do respond well to the gospel, and those are the ones we need to focus on, gathering the the church together you know and strengthening the church and um, it says to God who alone is wise sure only God is wise um, the wisdom of the the world is foolishness before God um, I've been reading through uh, Proverbs um, the last couple of months just over and over and um, Proverbs is, is great. It's a lot of things. The wisdom is there. You know, obviously Solomon, who wrote it, was uh, the wisest human to ever live. But even that, his wisdom is nothing compared to God. But Proverbs is, is an inspired writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So um, you see the wisdom there. And a lot of things are kind of backwards. They seem kind of backwards. When you think about it, you realize um, the wisdom there. The, the wisdom that only God could show us. We would have never figured that out on our own. And um, so to God alone, who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So yeah, that's basically the message. And um, we want to keep in mind here is that in verse 14, the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. So that's, that's really where the focus needs to be. Um, it's okay if we mess up as, as people, as Christians. Um, we shouldn't be okay with you know sin or accepting sin. We, we want to cut that out. But the way it works, I mean... Christians, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, which is something that happens when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, having that Holy Spirit, that's a guide. That's a compass inside you, inside, just joined to your spirit. And that is going to, to 
keep you on the right track in life. It's a good conscience. You have a good conscience, a sincere faith, a pure heart. So when you're doing the right things, the things that God wants you to do, that's what gives you joy. That's what makes you happy. It's a different mindset. And then, uh, so to please God is what makes you happy and filled with joy. And if you um, sin or if you get, you know, off track or start ignoring God or whatever, then you don't feel so comfortable, right? And that's, that's one of the ways that God pulls you in back to himself is with that, that conscience, that good compass of the Holy Spirit in you. So don't believe the devil's lie who always tries to tell the, the young Christians, the immature Christians, or the people who are on the fence and not even saved yet. He tries to make them think that Christian life is just such a drag, it won't be fun. That he, he try to make you think that you need that, that sinful lifestyle to be happy, and it's absolutely not true. It's just it's a matter of changing, having a different perspective to where... You know, once you have the proper perspective, you're plugged in to God, then you're drawing on God for your your joy, your your love, your power, right? Where's your power? It's in Christ. And uh, you're drawing from that, then um, the things that displease God are going to begin to displease you. The things that God thinks are ugly are going to be ugly to you, like sin. Okay, sin doesn't have the same appeal or draw that it once did. And what does draw you in is this, this, uh, this work in ministry and this, uh, I mean, there's a place for you in ministry. It may not be full time. It may not be vocational. It could be, you know, it could be anything. It could be just a prayer life. It could be, um. It could be volunteering. It could be witnessing to people that you run into and just meet randomly. It could be any number of things. But God created you for a purpose. And so the more we're, we're fulfilling the actual purpose that God created us for, that's where we, we start to find the, the joy in life, which is um, a joy that doesn't depend on circumstances. It's, it's, it's a joy from internally of this, just the spirit, feel, feeling the spirit stirring up in you. And uh, you wouldn't be happy doing anything else because that's what God created you for. So let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this sermon. Please help us as Christians to rely on Jesus Christ for, for all of our needs. Uh, help us to find all of our hope in him, all of our love c coming from Christ. And... Um, all of our righteousness obviously is in Christ. Help us to, to be comfortable with that and to rest in that and to know that it's true. And please strengthen us to um, fulfill our calling and in, uh, in ministry. And um, bless us, God, to be close to you. And we pray for you, for you to strengthen the church in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.